public health authorities, including those from the World Health Organization and local or national public health agencies, are actively investigating this outbreak, and the situation will continue to evolve. Next slide, please. What is a coronavirus? Well, the reality is that these are a large family of viruses that cause a wide-ranging bunch of illnesses from common cold to much more severe diseases that you may have heard of in the past, such as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, CoV, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, CoV. This new one, this novel coronavirus, is a new strain that had not been previously identified in humans. We know that these are transmitted, or can be, between animals and people. And there are several coronaviruses circulating in animals that haven't affected people yet. The animal source of this particular strain that is infecting people, this novel coronavirus, has not yet been identified. Common signs of infection from coronavirus include primarily respiratory symptoms, but also sometimes fever, cough, shortness of breath, and so on. In the more severe yet much more rare cases, it can progress to pneumonia and more severe respiratory syndromes and can lead to death. But the reality is with this novel coronavirus, it's estimated that more than 80% of the cases are relatively mild. Next slide, please. The spread of coronavirus does depend on the particular strain. Rarely, they can be spread through fecal oral sorts of transmission routes, but much more commonly through respiratory droplets, such as a, how a common cold would be transmitted. So these, with that as its primary transmission method, it can spread from one infected person to another through the air, by coughing or sneezing, by close personal contact, such as touching or shaking hands, or touching an object or a surface that may have virus particles on them, and then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes before you wash your hands. We are seeing some evidence of person-to-person -person transmission from this novel coronavirus, and there, there is investigation ongoing of some of these case clusters. Primarily, it's demonstrating, though, that there has to be very, very close contact with an infected person for this person-to-person -person transmission to occur, such as a healthcare worker who is caring for an infected patient. Next slide, please. We need to recognize that there are steps all of us can take to help protect public health. And across the many industries that we serve, we believe that everybody can have an important role in helping to protect public health. Ecolab is here to help you and your businesses with standard infection control practices, training, and compliance. Next slide, please. So a couple slides here on just basic protection mechanisms. First of all, as we think about ourselves, there is no vaccine available to protect you against this new coronavirus because it's new. But there are ways you can reduce your risk of infection by, by following fairly standard infection control practices, like washing your hands very often and correctly. The World Health Organization recommends performing hand hygiene with soap and water or using an alcohol-based hand rub if soap and water are not available. To avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands, to avoid close contact with people who are sick and regions where live animals are being sold or raised where there are excessive cases being reported. If it's warranted, wearing a mask and seeking medical advice immediately if you have a fever or other symptoms after traveling and make sure to tell the doctor where you have traveled to. Next slide, please. But we also need to protect others. So if you have cold-like symptoms, you can help protect others by following these kinds of practices. 
that are very much like protecting ourselves. Washing your hands, wearing a mask, staying home when you're sick, avoiding close contact with others, practicing sleeve and cough etiquette, such as using a tissue or sneezing or coughing into your flexed elbow, then throwing the tissue if, used, if you have used one into the trash and washing your hands, seeing a doctor and cleaning and disinfecting surfaces and objects. Next slide, please. Now leading into the next part of this webinar, I'd like to just briefly touch on a couple general sorts of questions we have received, which will get more specific from my colleagues here, and then we do have time at the end for even more specific questions as you have them. But thinking about what you need to do within your business for public health protection, firstly, is making sure that your employee health and hygiene practices are in place especially with an emphasis on proper hand hygiene. Disinfecting hard surface and high touch areas, such as those listed on the slide. The good news is that coronavirus is in enveloped viruses, and these are less resistant to disinfectants, which means that they can be used very effectively to kill coronavirus, which might be on a surface. And then where appropriate, making sure the right personal protective equipment is available and people know how to use it. Next slide, please. Now, what about food safety? Well, of course, standard food safety practices are always encouraged, beginning with and avoiding direct unprotected contact with live animals and surfaces that may be in contact with those live animals. Certainly to avoid consuming raw or undercooked animals or sick animals or the meat from them, avoiding cross-contamination by properly handling any raw kinds of products, and then properly cleaning and sanitizing food contact surfaces, including your hands and any utensils. But it is very, very important to keep in mind that there is no evidence that the 2019 novel coronavirus is being transmitted to humans through food. Next slide, please. Finally, another question is, should you worry about shipments coming from China? The reality is that coronaviruses really don't survive very long on surfaces. So the risk of spread from products or a package is very low. And to date, there is no evidence that supports transmission of the 2019 novel coronavirus with any imported goods. At this point, I'm going to turn the slides over to my colleague, Linda Homan, to talk about application in healthcare. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about uh, action plan for healthcare. Uh, and this is really divided into three different areas, uh, what we would do for patients, what we would do for our personnel, and what we would do for hygiene. And the first thing I would say is that the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention both have detailed plans for uh, management of known or suspected patients with coronavirus. And so uh, that's where the, the really the very best information is that's available to you. Uh, and this is an overview of that. And um, I highly suggest that you would go to the World Health Organization.int or cdc.gov for more information. So first of all, for patients, uh, we ask that the, parent, the patients who are known or suspected wear a surgical mask. Uh, we ask, have them evaluated in a private room with the door closed, and ideally that room would be an infection isolation room with reverse airflow. Uh, for healthcare personnel, we're asking healthcare personnel to use standard precautions, contact precautions, and airborne precautions. And that's just a, a measure of caution because we want to make sure that we completely understand how this virus is transmitted. And in addition to that, eye protection, which would be things such as goggles or a face shield. And then for hygiene for healthcare facilities, uh, hand hygiene is incredibly important, as Ruth already said. Uh, the World Health Organization recommends performing hand hygiene with soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub if soap and water aren't available, but frequent hand hygiene is 
in incredibly important. And then disinfection of surfaces using an EPA registered product that has a claim against emerging viral pathogens. And so that'll be what you'll look for on your product or information from your manufacturer is for a claim against emerging viral pathogens. And so with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Ed Snodgrass, to talk to you about uh, long-term care. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about long-term care, hospitality, and food service. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So stopping the spread of infection in long-term care is a standard business practice today, especially where sensitive resident populations are concerned. Long-term care should follow local health recommendations and reinforce infection prevention training for employees, including personal hygiene, hand washing, coughing into a flex elbow, and providing personal protection equipment in accordance with infection prevention policies at your facility. <clears throat> Ample access to hand soap and alcohol-based hand sanitizers <clears throat> excuse me, for employees and residents is also important. Some residents may need reminders on proper hand washing or the importance of using hand sanitizers. Clean and disinfect surfaces, including high touch point objects such as hand railings and elevator buttons more frequently. Resident rooms should be disinfected regularly in addition to public spaces. If there is a particular concern about the spread of illness, consider closing non-essential public areas and offering in-room dining. Next slide, please. Hospitality customers generally have a higher percentage of the customer base who have been traveling recently and who remain on the property for an extended period of time, such as overnight. And so hospitality customers often, are often highly concerned with infection prevention. For hospitality, we encourage properties to follow local public health recommendations and to follow their established infection prevention procedures. Here we call out a few that are common questions we receive around hospitality. Of course, ensure that your employees are practicing personal hygiene, washing hands frequently, and properly coughing into their elbow. Make sure hand soap and alcohol-based hand sanitizers are readily available throughout your property for employees and guests alike. Increase frequency of cleaning and surface disinfection, especially around high touch point objects such as elevator buttons, surfaces in the lobby, guest rooms, and fitness centers. Next slide, please. There is no evidence that coronavirus is spread through contaminated food, but basic food safety and infection prevention measures still apply. We always advise our customers to follow local public health recommendations and provide training to their employees on infection prevention and personal hygiene, washing hands frequently with soap and water, and coughing into a flexed elbow. Make sure guests and customers and employees have access to hand soap and alcohol-based hand sanitizers, maybe by adding additional hand sanitizer stations throughout your establishment. Vulnerable spots in restaurants that may require attention, additional attention are keeping soap dispensers filled in the restroom and the kitchen and making alcohol-based hand sanitizers available to the staff and guests. And disinfection, high, disinfect high touch, point, high touch points, door handles, menus, tables, chairs, and other things in the front of the house. In the kitchen, continue to apply food safety practices, ensuring foods are well prepared. And of course, it continues to be important to, to sanitize food contact surfaces in accordance with local regulations, both front and back of house. And with that now, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Tatiana Lorca to talk about global food and beverage. Thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna address what we're gonna talk, what recommendations are for food and beverage processing plants because that is a question I do get fairly often. So it really comes down to these four key steps. First, follow good manufacturing and food safety practices. And this includes practices from receiving, handling, and preparing any raw materials, ingredients, packaging materials, even utensils, work in progress, and finished products. Um, so that should not change. Then, because this is more of a public health issue, we need to make sure that our employee health and hygiene practices are in place and that they're maintained, including proper hand washing, as uh, our other speakers have mentioned. Now, um, let's talk about cleaning and sanitizing. So clean and sanitize food contact and non-food contact surfaces. So make sure those are done, as well as carrying out environmental cleaning and sanitation. So this means assuring that areas such as floors and walls, ceilings and equipment are all fully cleaned and sanitized. And as you are cleaning and sanitizing, make sure that you're only using those sanitizers which are known to be suitable for their use and uh, that they're suitable for their use in a food manufacturing facility and that you are following the label instructions because that's extremely important. I do wanna talk about uh, one of the questions that I get fairly frequently about this, um, which is what do I need to do differently um, 
to protect my people and my customers? And then what do I need to do as far as cleaning and sanitation? Uh, do I need to, to clean and sanitize more frequently during this outbreak? And I just like to highlight what I just mentioned and, and reinforce this. And, and we all know that cleaning and sanitation are critical components of the good manufacturing practices that should already be carried out regularly in your facility. And we want to make sure that your production environment is clean and sanitary and that you are complying with the law. Now, whether to increase the frequency during this outbreak has to be looked at through a risk benefit lens and then many things have to be considered. Now, firstly, you need to ask yourself, is your facility located within the outbreak zone? Are your employees affected? How exposed is your product? And if so, increasing the frequency may reduce transmission and it could be seen as a benefit. Now, we also know that every time you clean and sanitize equipment, following validated protocols and approved products, you do cause a little wear and tear on the equipment and the surfaces. So here's the risk. So what you need to consider is that you need to weigh the risk benefit equation here and you need to make a risk-based decision. And now I'll turn this back over to uh, Dr. Petra. Thank you, Linda, Ed, and Tatiana for terrific messages focusing in on, on the specific markets. Next slide, please. So just to briefly wrap it up here and then we'll jump to questions, Ecolab is here to help. And I urge you please to connect with your team for world-class training programs and tools. Think about the, the application of webinars and use of these. We have a number of these available on our website. We certainly provide on-site technical support as well as call center support available 24-7. Next slide, please. Bottom line, together we can all make a difference. And I think we've talked through several different ways to do this. Really, it focuses on following basic infection control practices. And if I can reemphasize the need for vigilant hand hygiene, I'm going to do that as many times as I can. On the other hand, we need to stay very alert to this because this is an evolving situation. So staying connected to developments about novel coronavirus is very crucial. Ecolab will do our best to share this information as it becomes available and as it may apply to all of you. Again, thank you for joining us and I will turn this over to my colleague Roman who will be monitoring questions. Thank you all. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Uh, thank you to our other presenters as well. We have a number of questions that have come in, um, and I want to jump right into them. But before I do, um, please know that we will send a copy of the presentation to everyone who has joined the webinar today, so you will have access to that presentation to share with your teams. In addition, a recording of this webinar will also be posted to ecolab.com. Um, so we'll have it on the website uh, for those that want to, in addition to sharing the presentation, want to share the actual webinar recording as well with their teams. So uh, Ruth and our other panelists, first question, how long can this virus live or survive on a surface? Well, this is Ruth. I will start off. Um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, keep in mind that this is a new virus, um, really not available for a lot of study, but the data that the, w the World Health Organization is sharing with us is that it's not all that likely that transmission can occur from an infected surface. The risk is much lower from them than from a direct droplet, which you may get from an infected person. So certainly being vigilant around surfaces which could be contaminated with uh, viral particles from one of these droplets is important. Um, but uh, at this point, um, it's not expected to be a significant route of transmission, but it is a possibility. Great. Thank you, Ruth. 
Uh, Ed, this might be a, a question for you, but um, do we know at this point if uh, laundry um, or, um, you know, uh, sheets, clothing, things like that, that you may see in a hotel, hospital, or long-term care facility, do we know if, if, if laundry is a concern for potential transmission of the illness? Yeah, that's a really great question. I'm glad that came up. So uh, I'd say three things on that. Number one, um, <clears throat> always follow your local health guidelines. Um, that will be number one. Number two, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I would say um, that when it comes to laundry, uh, you know, it's about the whole linen flow process from the room down to the laundry operation to, to keeping the linen uh, clean and stored. And make sure you're wearing your proper protective equipment, gloves and, and things like that, when you're actually handling the laundry from people's rooms. If somebody appears to be infected in any way, make sure you bag that linen in their room and bring it downstairs um, appropriately. And then um, when, for the laundry process itself, uh, what's recommended is to use just a, a standard detergent, which should be part of every laundry process um, that can emulsify grease and oils. Uh, there is no additional need. Like I said, follow your local health guidelines as well, but uh, there should be no additional need for a um, registered sanitizer product as part of the laundry process. Um, just the process of actually cleaning the linen through the washing machine and then drying it should be enough to reduce any pathogen contamination and prevent uh, cross-contamination. And then when the linen is, is complete and it's put on the shelf, make sure proper handling is observed so don't touch the dirty linen and then handle the clean linen with the same gloves or the same hands. So follow the standard um, procedures that are being followed today and you should be okay. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Tatiana, this might be one for you. Do we know if food grade sanitizers are effective uh, against this new coronavirus? That's a great question. And um, here I ultimately, um, I'm going to defer back to Ruth to see if she's got a little bit of information on this. Ruth? Sure. Um, you know, bottom line, um, because again, this is a new virus that, that really no one has access to, to do research against to any significant degree, and certainly um, not companies like this because it's, it's new. Um, what the allowance has been from the regulatory agencies at least in the U.S., is that disinfectants that have demonstrated of, uh, effective <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> effectiveness against viruses that are like the 2019 novel coronavirus when used in accordance with the direction can be used. So essentially it's um, use of a disinfectant that has a claim against um, a supporting virus or, or one that would be like novel coronavirus is deemed to be effective. Great, thank you, Ruth. So depending on what, sorry, depending on what the risk uh, might be believed to be present, um, using a disinfectant might be warranted, but it does need to be considered within the landscape of the whole risk that's presented. Another question coming in. Um, will uh, soap and water, from a hand perspective, uh, work to, um, to help protect against the virus, or do you also need uh, perhaps a hand sanitizer uh, in addition to soap and water? Linda, do you want me to answer? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say, <laughs> I would say that the World Health Organization and the CDC both say that you can use either alcohol-based hand sanitizer or soap and water. So there aren't any recommendations that I've seen so far that you need to do both. Um, the physical and mechanical action of washing your hands and rinsing them with water helps reduce uh, the bacteria and the viruses on your hands. Uh, and so I think there isn't any recommendation that you have to do both. You just have to do one or the other. If your hands are visibly soiled, then you should use soap and water. If your hands aren't visibly soiled, then you have the option to use alcohol-based hand sanitizer. I do think it's important to note as well, thank you, Linda, that um, generally soap and water are recommended first and alcohol hand sanitizer in situations where soap and water may not be readily available then sanitizer would, alcohol-based hand sanitizer would be a reasonable 
substitute for that. But with the caveat uh, related to visibly soiled hands, do need soap, um, soap and water to get that soap or to to get that dirt removed. Great. Here's a two-part question, and uh, we may have insight into one part, maybe not the other, but I will ask the question. Um, if you're looking at a hotel, um, would a hotel need to be worried about coronavirus transmission through uh, air ducts within the hotel as well as higher population common areas? So Ruth, I can talk just a moment to um, <clears throat> the HVAC system in general. So um, that, cause that question did come up recently. It's a great question. And uh, apparently, you know, transmission of this type of a virus is, is typically done and we're seeing it by closer contact. So the risk of getting uh, this disease transmitted via the HVAC system to you is very, very low. Um, so our recommendation would be that no additional things need to be done for an HVAC system. Um, to prevent it. Now, in terms of the open spaces, Ruth, I would rely on you for that question. Yeah, and, and I certainly support what Ed said. In fact, um, the World Health Organization um, is, is clear on this as well. We, again, we don't have evidence of transmission through HVAC systems, but it's something that is continually being assessed. And, and part of this evolving nature of this virus and its study, and trust me, there's lots and lots of, of public health scientists in many countries looking at questions just like this. Um, but there's not evidence to date of that. Through um, more public sorts of spaces, again, think about droplet transmission. So um, typically these are not over long distances, but within uh, a couple of feet of someone who is, again, actively sneezing, coughing, spreading infectious materials around through their droplets. Um, that's the kind of um, area to be thinking about. But if everybody is following the practices on keeping themselves uh, away from others when they are actively sick, practicing effective cough and sneeze etiquette and so on, that in combination with these other practices certainly reduces the risk tremendously. Ruth, uh, a follow-up question on that. Do we know if the virus requires moisture to survive transmission? You're talking about droplets, um, sneezes. Um, do we know if it requires moisture versus uh, dry surface or material? I would say we don't know that definitively, um, and this is something that that study, you know, further study that, that lots and lots of folks are doing is, is focused in on, among other things. Certainly transmission through a droplet, which is intuitively just more moist than, <laughs> than not, um, might lead us to think that, but we don't have a definitive answer on that. Okay. Linda, I believe this is a question for you. Um, is there any special treatment or recommendation that should be uh, applied to cleaning a room or disinfecting a room um, if a potential sick guest was within that room? That's a good question. And I think um, I would refer back to the World Health Organization and the CDC, but my understanding is that if you're using a disinfectant that's effective against uh, the novel coronavirus and you've uh, ensured that, uh, then your cleaning should really just be uh, standard cleaning. You don't, you try to use dedicated equipment wherever you can, according to the CDC. Uh, in other words, equipment that you're going to not use on another patient, but discard. If you can't use dedicated equipment, then you would want to disinfect any equipment uh, according to the manufacturer's instruction, using a disinfectant that's effective against the novel coronavirus. Um, and really those are the, the, that's the gist of the environmental hygiene recommendations that they have for healthcare situations. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a pretty good summary of, of what's being asked. I would also say, um, in addition to making sure you're using the right disinfectant, uh, the CDC is also recommending that you might want to do a little refresher training with your staff and to monitor how well they're cleaning and disinfecting surfaces and 
monitor the thoroughness of cleaning of high-touch objects in healthcare settings, just to make sure that your staff is sharpened up and, and doing the best job possible. So it's product plus process. You know, you have to make sure you not only use the right product, but that you're using it correctly and applying it to the right surfaces. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, another question coming in here, uh, are people at risk for coronavirus from perhaps a package or a product shipped from China? Yeah, we had a slide that addressed this, but I'm happy to go back to that. And um, the WHO is very clear on this, that that, that is not presenting a risk. Um, partly because of the time that such a shipment would just realistically take. Um, but there is not evidence of transmission through anything like that. And then, Ruth, a, a follow-up on that. So, you know, maybe it's one thing if it's packaging, but what about perhaps fruits, vegetables, food shipped from China? Is there a, a greater concern there or or what are we seeing or what might we, we know about that? Yeah, from a, from a coronavirus perspective, um, whether it's a, a package like a box or say a piece of fruit, there's really no distinction per se from a coronavirus transmission perspective. Um, typically, as, as we've said already, these viruses don't survive very long on, on surfaces really of any sort, so the spread from a product or a package is, is low. Um, that said, we can't forget about all of the, the normal kinds of food safety practices that we need to follow. And if, if there could be an enhanced risk of transmission of a more typical foodborne illness kind of agent from some of these food products, um, then certainly standard food safety practices, um, which is not really the focus of this webinar, but, but proper temperature control and cooking and, and minimizing cross-contamination, hand hygiene as a part of, of foodborne illness risk management certainly can't be ignored and, and should not be put aside just because we're so focused in on coronavirus. Thanks, Ruth. Another question here. Is there a, a virus similar to this particular coronavirus that, that people can, can look towards for perhaps uh, on a food grade sanitizer label or product label um, showing that that product may provide benefit against this particular coronavirus? Um, I can take that question. So, um, so we, at Ecolab, we, we do have emerging pathogen, pathogen claims on a number of our products. Um, these claims allow us to use certain viruses that are similar to the coronavirus to um, uh, not claim necessarily, but, but um, we can recommend them in use against the coronavirus. Um, so we do have a list of products. Um, I would say if you have questions on what those organisms are or which products you can use, talk to your local Ecolab representative um, for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and coronavirus, it, I mean, it is a virus that we are concerned about here. So we do need to be looking for um, claims against a virus that would have or, or would, re would require some activity against a virus. Um, this is not a standard, you know, salmonella kind of bacteria. It, it is a virus. Um, that said, I do think we need to be very careful about framing this up within the reasonable risk that you believe is presented. And, you know, in many, many parts of the world, um, the risk is, is so excruciatingly low um, that I urge you to keep that in mind. Ruth, along those lines, we're, you know, we're seeing news stories every day, um, you know, some saying that the, the virus could be st spread through the piping system within a building and, you know, other ways that the, the virus could be spread. Do you have any guidance, 
you know, regarding, uh, I guess, what we truly know about the virus at this point compared to what we may be seeing in the news? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's, I, I can't re refute and, and react to all kinds of news stories that are out there, and there certainly are, are lots and lots of them. Um, in following very carefully much of the um, communications from the World Health Organization, what I find very interesting is, is that is a rather significant focus of, um, of the WHO's response is a so-called um, mess buster kind of approach and in really trying to provide the most accurate information that's out there. Um, if someone wants to see this information, if I might urge you to Google World Health Organization or WHO and mess buster in the same um, search, uh, search string and you will get information related to that I have seen that information be added to over time, so they are continuing to work on um, adding more information to that. You know, but the reality is um, outside of China, the risk is considered very low um, as long as these basic infection sorts of control practices are in place. Um, and given that many of us here in the Northern Hemisphere are in the midst of, of influenza season, as we typically are this time of year, being more vigilant just in general about our health and about transmission of, of viral kinds of illnesses and practicing those basic kinds of infection control practices around effective hand washing, staying home when we're sick, practicing sneeze and cough etiquette and so on do, do go so far in um, preventing overall kinds of respiratory illnesses. And that is, many, in large part, many of the messages that are coming from the World Health Organization are focused in on continuing to emphasize the need to follow those basic kinds of practices. I know that's not a direct answer to the question, but that's the reality that we're hearing. Thank you, Ruth, that is very helpful. Um, I guess I'll open this question up to everyone. Um, you know, for, the, for employees within the hospitality industry, perhaps the healthcare industry as well, um, are there recommendations that these employees should be taking to help protect themselves while they are in their work environment? And this is Linda, and I think Ruth had a slide on this earlier about how to protect ourselves, and I think it's really true in almost any setting in that you're practicing good hand hygiene, you're practicing good respiratory hygiene, in other words, coughing into your sleeve, coughing into a tissue and washing your hands after, you're staying home if you're sick so that you're not infecting others, um, really just the same kinds of things that you would do uh, during influenza season are the the basic practices that we all need to follow to protect ourselves. Uh, obviously, if you're in a situation where you're with a known or suspected uh, patient or person who's infected with the virus, then, then the precautions change and then the way that you're going to um, move around that environment change. But just in general, uh, those same basic things that we do to prevent ourselves from catching a cold or from catching influenza are good practices to follow to prevent transmission of this coronavirus. Ruth, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Nope, that says it well. Same on the food service and, and lodging side, exactly the same recommendation. One more question here. Um, based on what we know about coronaviruses in general, um, would temperature play an impact in transmission, either if it is uh, very cold temperatures uh, like we, we have here in the, the, the far north of the United States this time of year or perhaps uh, more warmer locations. Does temperature play a, a role in transmission? Typically not. Um, if we take viral transmission in general or respiratory viral transmission in general, um, 
the one thing that we might consider is, is that those of us who are living in colder climates tend to stay inside more so than if it were warmer outside more consistently. And just by virtue of that fact, we are, um, you know, staying inside and staying potentially closer to people. So emphasis on these basic infection prevention practices like really isolating yourself if you are suffering with symptoms of respiratory illness uh, and being vigilant in the other ways that we've, we've talked about uh, may be even more important in these colder climates just because of the reality of our being, uh, you know, put all together in a building, et cetera. One more question here, perhaps, for the uh, lodging uh, industry, uh, long-term care, and, and probably uh, hospital uh, facilities as well. Um, you know, we talked earlier about hard surfaces. Um, do, we, do we have a sense of um, the virus and the possibility of survival in, say, a mattress or um, you know, bedding, you know, beyond perhaps just the, the sheets that would probably be laundered on a regular basis. I guess, Ruth, I'd, I'd look to you for, yeah. for this. I'm, I'm not... Unfor yeah, we, we don't have any data on that, um, but I think we need to think about just general transmission of, of respiratory illnesses is, you know, transmission through something like a mattress is not is not how they are transmitted. It, it again, it's, it's direct droplets um, from one infected person coming into another person. You know, someone sneezing in your face to be that graphic. Um, that is how they are, are transmitted most commonly and there's just no evidence of that, um, you know, kind of side route through a mattress impacting that. One more question here. Do we know if, um, you know, we probably might not know for this particular coronavirus, but coronaviruses in general, do we know about survivability on perhaps a cleaning cloth that is being used with the appropriate disinfectant? This is Linda. I can, I mean, I can just take a stab at it, but I think the main the main thing to realize is that these disinfectants have a contact time. And so if your virus comes in contact with that disinfectant for the recommended contact time uh, and the disinfectant is effective against the novel coronavirus, then it will be, you know, it will not survive on that cloth in contact with that disinfectant for the recommended contact time. Anybody else on the call want to? No, I think from a practical standpoint, that that is yeah. that makes tons of sense. I mean, there Great. certainly uh, have well, never been any studies done yet to show how long does the coronavirus live on a cleaning cloth that is saturated with a disinfectant. That data doesn't exist. So I'm just extrapolating from what we know about disinfectants and viruses at this point. Thanks, Linda. Uh, here's one, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, guidance or insight we might have onto this, but I will throw this question out. So within uh, hotels that may have uh, spas or hot tubs or hydrotherapy uh, uh, pools within uh, the healthcare setting, um, you know, whether it's coronavirus or viruses in general, um, what's the likelihood of transmission and what special precautions, if any, should, should be taken? Well, I guess. certainly some, I'll let you start in a second, Ed, but, but certainly the, um, you know, someone who is infectious and, and actively shedding the virus through their droplets shouldn't be in those kinds of areas. <laughs> Yeah, so Ruth, all I was going to say is make sure that high touch point surfaces within the pool and um, hot tub areas are being disinfected regularly, um, you know, to prevent surface to person transmission. Um, I would say manage your pool and your, and your hot tub in a lodging situation as you do today. 
Um, otherwise, I don't have any recommendations in that in that setting. Yeah, there's no there's no evidence that we have of transmission through this route yeah. of coronaviruses to date. Okay, we've had a lot of uh, questions come in regarding specific products and their effectiveness. Uh, we won't dive into uh, specific product names, but we have talked a little bit about uh, disinfectants and, and you know proper cleaning procedures. Um, any general guidance beyond what was already discussed during the webinar regarding the types of products you should be looking for for uh, uh, surface cleaning? So from a food service, hospitality, and long-term care standpoint, like I said, contact your, you know, if you, if you use Ecolab, contact your local Ecolab representative. They will be able to give you the guidance on the products that are recommended. Possibly some are already in the portfolio today. If not, they can recommend products that are outside of your portfolio but um, have emerging pathogen claims on them, specifically, specifically for coronavirus. Uh, so... I would just say for healthcare, um, obviously contact your Ecolab account executive for specific information about products, but the EPA has developed guidance for manufacturers on how to um, be able to state effectiveness against novel coronavirus by meeting the criteria for this emerging viral pathogens claim. And so the EPA has detailed uh, guidance on their website and companies that Sell disinfectant, then we'll be able to communicate to you what, which of their products meet those emerging viral pathogen claims. And so if you talk to your Ecolab associate, they can tell you exactly which products meet those claims. Okay. Um, a lot of information shared today. So, you know, I, I guess this is a bit of a, a recap question. Um, you know, what are the top two or three action steps that, that businesses should take to help protect their employees and guests? Well, I would say, you know, ensuring that uh, employees are aware of the information about coronavirus and sharing, for example, this, this webinar with your employees could certainly be a way to do that, but there's lots and lots of materials out there making sure they're from a credible source um, and reflect the relevant risk that might be presented in your particular area. And then making, <clears throat> making sure that employees follow the right health and hygiene practices, certainly focused in on hand hygiene, washing their hands thoroughly with soap and water or using hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available, um, those alcohol-based hand sanitizers, for example, um, and then focusing in on uh, isolating themselves if, if employees are sick, practicing sneeze and cough etiquette, disinfection of high touch point surfaces, et cetera. Uh, again, following the standard sorts of practices that one might follow when there might be an elevated risk related to the influenza uh, viruses and so on. Great, thank you, Ruth. Uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour, and uh, I would like to take a moment to thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Ruth Petran, Linda Holman, Dr. T Dr. Tatiana Lorca, and Ed Snodgrass. Thank you for uh, your time today and providing uh, your expertise and guidance. Um, just a reminder to all of our participants that we will send out a copy uh, of the presentation from this webinar, so please watch for that and share that with your teams. And we will have a recording of this webinar uh, posted to Ecolab Dot com very soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that as well and, and share that link with your teams as needed. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we did have some questions about future uh, coronavirus webinars. It is something that we are, are, are definitely considering uh, once we you know, have a better understanding of this particular coronavirus or there are new developments that, that we do need to address. So stay tuned for more information on that as well. Um, we did receive all of these questions. Unfortunately, we did not have time to get to all of them. 
um, but we will take a look at how best to uh, recap the questions that have come in and provide guidance as well. So uh, one more thing to keep an eye out for. So again, thank you for your time today. Uh, Product-specific questions, please make sure that you're reaching out to your Ecolab representative, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for your time today.